Jack Smith is here to talk about his newest book, Peyton Place Comes Home to Maine. Um, you might remember Mac came and spoke about Mainers on the Titanic, and that was his first book. And I think you have two more in the making You're, you can probably fill everyone in on. Um, Mac is a Navy veteran of the first Gulf War and former news reporter for the Bar Harbor Times. He lives in Stockton Springs and in the city of Sandy Point where he's restoring his family homestead, which I think is interesting too, so I'd love to hear more about that. All right. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. And I want to thank you for the kind invitation to the Berwick Public Library. My name is Max Smith. I'm here from Stockton Springs, which is about three hours up the, the turnpike on the Penobscot River. And I was here on April 10th, uh, 2018, which was about five days before the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. So it was a very appropriate time, and I was treated well, and I appreciate it. And I want to introduce you to my second book, Peyton Place Comes Home to Maine, The Making of the Iconic Film. And this is published by Down East Books, the same good people who bring us Down East Magazine. <clears throat> and if you would, picture it. It's spring of 1957. It's almost 65 years ago. And our country was a much more conservative place. You couldn't say the word pregnant on television, and the married couple Desi and Lucy Ricardo couldn't be pictured together in the same bed. And at the same time in 1957, a new book's come out, and it's an immediate bestseller. The book is Peyton Place, and its author, New Hampshire native Grace Metallius, has written a book about nature, human relationships, and scandal, and she's peppered that book with a lot of graphic depictions of physical relations. Now, this book soon becomes known as a dirty book because of that, and it's banned in many parts of the United States and the entire country of Canada. And every time it's banned, it climbs higher on the bestseller list until this dirty book is actually in the homes of one out of every 27 Americans. It sold 9 million copies. It dominated the bestseller list. And, uh, and it was shaking the foundations of conservative America. People were forced to talk about this issue. It was the talk of the time. And it's spring of 1957, it's almost Easter, and the people of Maine are shocked when they open their newspapers one day to read the following headline, Novel Too Hot for Vermont May Be Filmed in Maine. Now, how did uh, Peyton Place get to be here, and did it just walk right into Maine and say we're going to film this really scandalous book here? I was always quite curious, how did it get here? And the, big, the answer is, really, there was a perfect storm of two events that were very separate, yet when they collided, they fit together very well. On the West Coast, in Hollywood, 20th Century Fox movie producer Jerry Wald has just bought the rights to Peyton Place and he wants to capitalize on all this publicity. And he, um, he wants to film it fast and he wants to film it before July because he's very practical. He wants to film it in a New England town but wants to do it before tourist season. And uh, so what he does is the first thing he does is he goes to New Hampshire. It seems a natural place. It's where the author came from and where the book is set. And by this time, Grace Metallius was done with Hollywood and, and Jerry Wald, and he did not receive a very good uh, reception. So they scrap New Hampshire. They go to Vermont to scout locations there. And after three weeks, Vermont... They don't want to say no outright, but they don't want him there. And, and Jerry Wald's desperate. He's really desperate, so he comes to the third choice, which is the state of Maine. Now, this the second part of this perfect storm is down in the Camden-Rockport area, the Camden-Rockport Chamber of Commerce has just invested about $25,000 into a national ad campaign to draw attention to the area. Uh, motor cars were huge now, and they wanted to get that traffic in. And there was an advertisement in the New York Times. They were really going all out. And then <clears throat> Hollywood comes knocking, and 
it caught the interest of the people of Camden and Rockport. Now, when uh, movie executives first came here, they came and scouted four locations, Camden, Wiscasset, Skowhegan, and Waterville. These two executives uh, visited these areas, and on the third day, the movie's director, Mark Robson, arrived to make a decision from amongst these four areas. <clears throat> and he was not received with a warm welcome. On the day he arrived, the Lewiston Sun Journal wrote an editorial saying, we see that Camden, Wiscasset, and at least two other main communities are being considered as locations for the filming of the best-selling book, Peyton Place. But before residents of the town chose and clapped their hands in joy over the fame they will presum presumably acquire, to say nothing of the income involved, we suggest they read the book and ask themselves if they want their town or city associated with it in the minds of other readers and film goers. It's the lack of other redeeming vo motivations that makes Peyton Place just another place for clandestine amours, and we somewhat doubt if even the broad-minded people of any main town would want it known as the vicarious locale or of such uh, purposeless goings on. The Manchester Union, just very briefly, the Manchester Union out of New Hampshire uh, was quite scathing. They, uh, how anybody could feel anything less than horror at the idea of his hometown being used as the background for a movie to be made from one of the filthiest novels of our day is a little hard to see. <laughs> Publicity and notoriety have not been the same in the past, but apparently Camden thinks so. Um, Maine's desire to get down and wallow in the pigsty of what is modern-day Hollywood must seem very strange indeed to those who have labored hard in days gone by to make great Maine a great and respected state. So that's the welcome to Maine. Um, the... Portland newspaper, the Portland Press Herald, I believe, they came out a day later in favor of the movie being shot here. Then the Bangor Daily News kind of went down the middle, but ended up uh, endorsing the movie being filmed here. And uh, artistic, artistic expression, artistic license was cited quite often as a reason to have the movie here. The decisions announced, and immediately uh, the town manager of Camden announces a cleanup week coming up shortly where people can bring out lawn debris and stuff and the town will come pick it up and take it away. The Camden IGA starts offering free flower seed packets with every purchase to spruce things up uh, and there was a lot of activity. But what happens is immediately the national press arrives in Camden and they seem to arrive with a preset story that the that us hicks in Maine don't even know what's going on in Pey the book Peyton Place because we never would have read a book to start with, and and they and they and that we were being hornswoggled, and what the reporters come out with the worst thing they can find is that the Camden Public Library doesn't carry the book, but they're not finding this narrative. People are not are not complaining like they would think. Um, now, June, the start of June is when the stars start to arrive. They come in in a staggered fashion, depending on when they're going to shoot their scenes. Um, the center of operations in Camden was at the Camden, Publi uh, the Camden Public Landing, and, which is a small space to begin with, and the Chamber of Commerce had an information booth down there, a small information booth. And there were, by this time, there were five or six executives from 20th Century Fox who were in that booth, along with three volunteers from the Chamber of Commerce. So it was tight, and it was the hub of activity. Uh, a few examples, uh, they had to find a, a steam engine, uh, because diesel locomotives uh, were now being used in Maine, but the movie was set in the 40s, so they needed a steam engine for their opening scene. They needed to get permissions from homes and businesses. They needed to audition the Camden American Legion band, so while everything's going on, the band comes and plays and marches around the landing, and that was their audition. One of the big things they had to do was Mount Batty at the time did not have a road system. And one of the key scenes in the movie is on Mount Batty. And so they had to figure a way to get one or two tons of 
move the equipment up the up the mountain and all the actors and the crew and this movie was known for its visual its photography and a lot of the equipment was very sensitive so a lot of time was spent doing that and then what we find during this time a minister from a local church stops by and lets the movie executives know that the choir that they had requested is not available to perform in the movie in one of the scenes so that's where we where you would see the rejection of Peyton Place with small places like this um, now the Chamber of Commerce three volunteers were in charge of casting extras and they were in charge of getting props and because this movie was so well known and talked about they were getting letters from across the state across New England and even across the country and I'm just going to read a few very quick examples. This letter's from Augusta. In uh, and I should say one of the things they needed to find were automobiles from the time. So there was a big search. You would get more for bringing in an automobile than you would for being an extra yourself. So from Augusta, in 1935, I trained a duck. He was featured in a movie, also on the late Fred Allen show. He has passed away, but I love his famous pictures and his recordings. He was very famous, and during his career, he bought me a new Plymouth in 1937. I still have the car and would like to present the car to you if you want it. It's a beautiful old car, and I've kept it all these years in his memory. And then briefly from Lewiston. On stage at age seven years, first picture with Rudolph Valentino. Age 60, can pass for 40 with a little makeup. Uh, and there were a bunch of fun letters, uh, fun to look back at. Uh, and so what happens is the movie, the movie starts filming in Camden, Rockport, and the, the various locales. And I'm not going to go into the details about the filming. They're all in the book. But I just want to emphasize there seemed to be an, a singular atmosphere in Camden that summer. I talked to an extra named Jay Foster who was in the movie as a young man, and a, young, a boy actually. And he said there was just, there was just a singular atmosphere in, in Camden. And it was nice. And schedules would be posted daily around town so the extras knew where to go to report and which and it would change daily based on weather uh, the radio station out of Rockland would post bulletins so people knew where to go the cast and crew stayed in a hotel in Rockland and a reporter asked one of the Camden residents why they were staying over in Rockland and he said he figured it was because they wanted to live it up over there so uh, and and okay, and then they, they spend two days filming in Belfast, and they film at the Belfast High School. And what happens is the scenes filmed there required extras, but they, need, they had a uh, brief speaking part. So they recruited the Crosby Footlights Club, which was uh, the drama club for the Belfast High School, and had those young people serve as extras for those couple of scenes. And then the biggest scenes to be filmed were the Labor Day picnic and the Labor Day parade. And they were filmed on June 18th and 19th, and this is where most of the extras were used. And it, Maine was going through a heat wave at this time, so if you watch the movie, you can see some of the scenes were, that were filmed the second day, because these people are burned. They burned hard, but they weren't going to miss the chance to be in that movie. And it's, I mean, real obviously burned. Uh, and this Jay Foster said at the end of each day's filming, the, the movie company would take the kids down. There was an ice cream stand at the landing or near the landing, and they could all get an ice cream. And he got maple walnut. He, you could just tell it was a very vivid memory. Um, during this time, I'm just checking the time there. Uh, during this time, as I said, it's a heat wave. So it's decided to take the cast and crew out for a cruise on the Penobscot Bay. Really nice way to cool off, and I'm sure they did cool off. But the vehicle they used, they the boat they arranged to take the cast and crew was a sardine carrier out of Port Clyde. Now, I just, I can't picture, unless it was brand spanking new, I'm just not picturing how that was pleasant for these people from Hollywood. Um, 
now, and what happens is filming wraps up towards the end of June, and on the last day of filming, these movie executives announce that Lana Turner, who's the biggest star in the movie, and the biggest star, the biggest star in the movie at the time, is not going to appear in Camden. Well, they've been doing bait and switch all this, all the month of June. You'd read the paper one day, Lana Turner's arriving Thursday. You'd read Thursday's paper, Lana Turner's delayed, she'll be arriving next week. Next week was the coming weekend. Kept dangling her, and there's no proof that it was intentional, but I think it was intentional. I don't think she ever planned to be here. And this Jay Foster said uh, this, the city of Camden, the town of Camden, never forgave her for that. They took it as a slight. And, uh, but she gets, her, she gets hers, just you wait. Um, after the movie wraps up, it, Camden was described as like being at a, we a huge wedding where all the guests have left and it was just quiet and kind of empty. So what happens is now everybody's waiting for the big article in Life magazine. I'm sure we all know Life magazine, huge in the 50s and millions of homes every week, known for its big pictures and small stories. Every, time, every news story, pretty much, you would see from that time mentioned that the reporter and the photographer from Life were at whatever event that they were reporting on. So the people of Camden, are, they can't wait to see their beautiful city, their town, in this Life magazine and see what the reporter has to say about it. While Ham Hall, the editor of the Camden Herald, about a week before the story comes out, puts out his own story and lets them know you're going to be disappointed. And I'm going to read just a uh, uh, shortened version of their story, which was short to begin with. <clears throat> amidst, amidst adulation, a note of protestation. The movie company came cautiously to Camden, Maine this summer. All 20th Century Fox wanted to do was spread $100,000 or so around among the townspeople and return use a little local scenery and about a third of the town's 3,700 people to make a movie of Peyton Place, which tells scandalous things about a little New England town, a lot like Camden, and there was worry about what Camden folks would think of it. The people need not have worried. On demand for $10 a day per man, mobs turned out for movie parades and picnics. Then, uh, then more people began to read this novel of rape, murder, and suicide, and their hair stood on end at the role Camden was playing. <laughs> there were cries of indignation and uh, letters of protest to the town manager, but most Camdenites were having too much fun playing movie actor to pay much mind. This, you know, it's just, it's insulting. And I told you about that preconceived story that the press came with, and that's exactly what it was. And as you remember at the very beginning, the headline in the Camden Herald and across the country, novel too hot for Vermont may be filmed in Maine. Mainers knew what they were getting into. And just to, to, to portray us as these rubes that, that, that fell for that dollar, so insulting, so insulting. The cries of indignation, the protest to the town manager, one protest. There were a few letters, letters to the editor doing all this time and stuff. One complaint. So, and the exchange between town officials and life is in the book. It, it got, got a little mean-spirited and life printed a bit of a retraction, but it was out there. Um, but the attention is turned now because it's announced that Camden, uh, Peyton Place is going to make its national premiere in Camden. This was something some of the Camden residents pushed for while the movie was being filmed. They had residents sign a petition, a big long theatrical petition, that they presented to the movie's publicist while they were in Camden. And it was announced that the movie would premiere one evening in Camden, then the next day nationally. Uh, so all attention turns to that, and uh, it's July 11th, 19, uh, it's December 11th, 1957, 
and it's a big day for Camden. And when I was putting this book together, this is one of those times that my imagination was just filled with what it must have looked like. It was Christmas time, and Camden was already decorated for the holidays, and they just spiced it up a little bit. The day of the premiere was one of those main winter days that it's warm for a main winter day, and the sun was out, it was beautiful. They had activities throughout Camden all day long. Um, and they had two showings of the movie that evening. Uh, they tried to get stars from the movie to come to the premiere. They couldn't, but they did get Betty Davis and Gary Merrill, who Gary Merrill, a resident of Maine, and Betty Davis, his wife. And on a personal note, I'd, I'd rather see Betty Davis than Lana Turner any day. Um, and the movie's well received. A lot of local people in there uh, you know, just seeing people they knew on the screen, and it really sounded like it was a nice occasion. And there's people there from all across the country, and a reporter from Rhode Island is there, and he calls Grace Metallius's house and asks why she's not at the premiere. Well, Grace didn't answer the phone or talk to the reporter, but her, her manager did. And what his response was, Grace wasn't invited. Well, Betty Davis quickly cleared this up. She said, I invited Grace myself. Grace Metallius, a great writer in that first book, knew how to turn anything into negative publicity. Uh, she was very good at that. And uh, so, okay, and that takes us to the Oscars. Peyton Place was nominated for nine Oscars. It won no Oscars. Uh, it lost to the, the Bridge Over Ridger, River Kwai, which I've never read, uh, but, but, and, but what happens is, this is where we get back to Lana Turner. On the night of the, that Oscar award ceremony, she's been dating this mobster named Johnny Stompanato, and who knows there's gonna be trouble there. And, uh, and what happens is, uh, Johnny comes to her, house the night of after the Oscar awards and he, he actually uh, physically abuses her and she orders him out a week later he comes back and allegedly her daughter kills Johnny Stompanato and, and probably you've heard parts of that but this is where we take a, an interesting little circle while that's going on Lana Turner has to testify into the inquest about Johnny Stompanato's death and what Life magazine, and I didn't realize Life was so snarky, but it, they were a snarky little magazine. They posted all these pictures of Lana Turner in different roles where she had a, a courtroom scene, including Peyton Place, and just sort of insinuated, because Johnny Stompanato's family had said, no, Lana killed him and she's making her daughter take the, the fall. So Life prints all these pictures insinuating, no, Lana knows how to lie at a, in a courtroom for a Hollywood movie. I mean, it was, it was snarky. Um, yeah, and yeah. All right, so I'm going to start to bring her around here. I will say if you get a chance to read this book, I hope you will then take a chance uh, to uh, watch the movie after that. You'll see a lot of little insights you're going to see there. There's a few big inconsistencies in the movie. One is the, the Greyhound bus. There's a scene where Selena Cross gets on the Greyhound bus. Uh, Allison McKenzie gets on the Greyhound bus to go to New York City, but the bus is headed in the wrong way. I mean, they, it was for filming. They had to do it just so. But you go to Camden, watch Peyton Place with anyone from Camden, they're going to let you know that. Um, my, one of my personal favorites, Crosby High School is in Belfast, which is two towns over from where I come from. The scene, one of the first scenes, Allison's running from her home in Camden to school. So she's actually running from uh, Camden to Belfast. But when she comes running into the school, she's coming from the wrong direction. So she literally, or she cir circumnavigated the globe to get to school and did it really quick. She's, it's, it's fun seeing things like that. The, the roads, you'll see a lot of scenes where the roads are just wet. And apparently the movie company wash down the roads every morning. I don't know if it was just to keep them looking clean or it was some of the movie was set in the winter so maybe it was supposed to look like the snow had just melted but it just looks out of place to me. Um, so to wrap it up, uh, Camden and those areas they took a big uh, risk on on artistic expression and they got 
uh, pilloried for it a little bit, but in the long run, I think it's held up for them. Uh, in Maine, in the summers, you always find a town or two that's showing Peyton Place. In Camden, they often have retrospectives. They had a big uh, 50th, I believe, anniversary. And uh, they took a, a risk on artistic expression, and I think it's paid off. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up right there, but I'm going to do my two-minute book commercial. My book, Peyton Place, is available for $20. I take check or cash. I have my book Mainers on the Titanic here. It's avail available for $15. And next month my third book's coming out. It's called Maine's Hail to the Chief, A History of Presidential Visits to the Pine Tree State. And what it is, it's a look. We've had 18 sitting presidents, I believe, visit our state and it's a look at those visits while they were in office and some of the presidents came at some very controversial times Nixon was here, uh, President Nixon was here uh, just a, less than a month I think before he uh, resigned and Bill Cohen our senator was on the investigating committee and was not invited to the ceremony there's an interesting story for each one you find down in Bar Harbor, there would sometimes be a little mix-up that oh, it's just good stuff in there. It's just how I'm just gonna say it. They just because you gotta, you know, you gotta find the fun. Um, and that's really it. Uh, I'm gonna say to you that if you choose not to buy one of my books, I will not give you the stink eye on the way out of here, because I appreciate you spending some time here and to listen to me talk about it. But I would ask if there are any questions or anything anybody wants to add. So it was the choir that chose not Yes. Do you, is there any indication of why? Well, the church, especially in Vermont, there were scenes that required, uh, I think it was a graduation scene they wanted the choir for, or an Easter scene. And I think the church just didn't want to do it, but they didn't want to make a big thing of it. Uh, in Woodstock, Vermont, it was open and controversial and talked about. I think the church didn't want to be in, have the choir in the movie or be in the movie at all, but they didn't want to make a big deal about it. Uh, Camden was involved. By this time, movie officials had uh, given the script to local religious leaders to let them see it beforehand. Of course, it needed a rating from the Legion of De Decency, and uh, and this is 20th Century Fox, a very mainstream studio. They weren't going to get too risque. So, but yeah, that was just one of those quiet rejections. Mm -hmm. yeah, seemed to be. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to make the movie? It was. It really was less than a month here in Maine. Then they return to California, and they do a lot on the sound set on the stages out there. Lana Turner, her, her uh, body double, did some scenes here in Maine. If you watch the movie and you see scenes in Camden, you'll see the back of her. And that, there's a scene in Lincoln, at Lincolnville Beach, you see the back of her. And there's a scene of her in front of her house, but they've recreated it in Hollywood. So, and I don't know how long it took there, but yeah, and the, the cast was actually done before the crew was, but there was some bad weather, so the cast had all left. The crew did stay for another week or so to, sh to shoot some exterior shots. Yeah. Yes, sir? Where'd they find the steam locomotive? Well, now this is interesting. <laughs> they never, they'd never found one, apparently, because this was for, I think it was the opening scene. The, the new principal's coming to town, and a train's coming in, and he has to stop. And while he's there, he looks and can see... He sees a tar paper shack with poverty, uh, very obvious, and a sort of a wrong side of the tracks reference. What they do is you don't see the you don't see the engine. It starts with the cars going by the crossing. So they ended up having to work around that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the stars of the movie, this Russ Tamblin, who played Norman Page, a pivotal character, he actually uh, arrived in. Rockland by Greyhound bus, but didn't arrive at his scheduled time, so he actually had to hitchhike from Rockland to Camden. <laughs> it was just kind of cool. And he, he wasn't well, well known, but kind of, I think, kind of well known. So it was just, there was just so many quirky little things like that that, that took place during that time. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Are you a movie buff? Like, how did you get this? Yes, I'm glad. That's funny you asked that. I'm not so much a movie buff. And I had one criticism on Amazon.com, which was... It wasn't Hollywood enough, and I what I wrote back was this isn't Hall, uh, this isn't Maine meets Hollywood. This is Hollywood meets Maine, and uh, and so it's not. If this is a Maine history book that involves Hollywood. Um, I will say when the cast and crew came, they couldn't have been. There seemed to be a really special relationship between them and the people of Camden. There were events for them every night. Uh, and you'll read in here, the people of Maine sent a Christmas tree to Hollywood, which was donated to a children's hospital that Christmas. Uh, they made their own Oscars. They called them the Brewsters for the woolen mill that was in Camden. They were Brewster plaid shirts. And that, it, it was and related to the Oscar. The, and, and the Hollywood people were doing the same thing well after the movie was gone. There was a, uh, seemed like a definite uh, uh, friendship between everybody, so. You know, they should, and I will tell you, in the back of the book, I've written out all the locations used. I did get the, I got the locations from the Camden Public Library. They've put together a very nice scrapbook down there. But there is a list of the locations. There's a new show called 207 on WLBZ. They actually came, this was so fun. They talked to me in the center of Camden, and then they would, they filmed the places that were used in the film, and first they'd show the clip from the film and then they'd cut it directly into d today. And they showed two or three places like that. It was beautiful. They, they really took some effort with that, so. I forgot what the, oh yeah, so there would be a perfect tour, perfect opportunity for a tour down there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're too busy writing. Well, see, the, no, no, and I have to, I love Camden, but I'm, Stockton and Camden are two very different places, <laughs> so, and I feel welcome down there, I love it, it's beautiful down there, but it's not my place, it really isn't, uh, yeah, just isn't, but, yeah, well, I really appreciate everybody being here, if anyone wants a book, you're welcome to it, and if not, I really do appreciate all of you being here, time's, time's valuable and precious, and it's nice of you to take some time out well, tonight. Well, we always enjoy having you. So thanks so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank we'll you. We'll have you back in the next book. I am Perfect. fascinated with that. Yeah, I'll stay right in touch with you. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's supposed to be out next month. And uh, it's, you know, out of, and I have, I told Sharon earlier during the quarantine, I put together a few more books. So I actually have two more coming out after that. Uh, so I get to take a little break, and now that things are open again, I can get back to promoting these. This is the first live talk I've had, and I, I've done a few Zooms, and I can't tell you how much I miss sort of seeing how people are reacting to the different parts of the talk. You just don't get that with Zoom. This has been invaluable and very much appreciated. So, so. That's good. Yeah. We all feel the same way. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it.